reflect together. Right? We conclude today uh, our month of uh, reflecting on the theme of radical hospitality. A hospitality we've been talking about that moves us beyond a passive welcome and out into the world, making sure that all are included, not just in our circle of concern, but in the bounty of this earth uh, that we all live, uh, in which we all live, the abundance of the universe. This hospitality is more than just putting out chips and salsa when the neighbors come over. Our work is to extend hospitality where and whenever we have the influence to make the world itself a home for all people. So today as we wrap up our theme, I want to ask, is God hospitable? All of the world's major religious traditions call us to offer hospitality to one another. It's one of the basic themes of religion itself. In the Christian tradition, that's probably best exemplified in the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to tell you that story for a few minutes. The story started with a question. As the author of the Gospel of Luke tells it, Jesus was teaching a crowd when an expert in religious law stood and asked him, how do I inherit eternal life? Now, he probably wasn't asking, how do I get to heaven? More like, how do I live the right kind of life? So Jesus answered his question, as he was wont to do, by asking him a question in return. What do you read in the law about living the right kind of life? And the expert in religious law quoted Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, right, that's it, now go do that. But the expert in religious law wasn't satisfied. He said, now look, Jesus, legally, there's still a question here. <laughs> if I am to love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? A question might seem nitpicky, but it reflects a debate that was, if not raging, at least simmering in first century Judaism. The Torah says, be kind to our neighbors, but who are our neighbors? Tradition says this is one of the most important commands in Scripture, and you don't want to screw up here. <laughs> so you want to know, to whom am I supposed to be kind? Am I doing this right? Different groups had various answers. The Essenes, the religious fanatics who created the Dead Sea Scrolls, said that the Jews' kindness should extend to no one but fellow Jews. Those were the limits. You had to do that, but no more. Some argued that the loving kindness of God's people should extend to the resident immigrant. Religious scholars by the dozens took cracks at defining what the Torah meant when it said, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, being a first century Jewish person, gave his opinion on that religious debate with the story of the Samaritan. A Judean man and Jesus' hearers, the people who listened to Jesus tell this parable would have been Judean, was robbed and beaten by a band of thieves and left for dead. And then come by two people who should have helped him. A priest first, the most respected man in society. But not only does the priest pass this guy by without helping him, he crosses to the other side of the road to avoid him. Then a Levite comes by, a member of the tribe of Levi, again, a highly respected office in this culture. Once again, the guy doesn't only not help the beaten and bloody person in the ditch, he too crosses to the other side of the road to go around him. I think the priest and the Levite did what they needed to do. I think they were just reacting to this passage from the book of Numbers. This shall be a perpetual statute for the Israelites and for the alien residing among them. Those who touch the dead body of any human being shall be unclean for seven days. So two religious officials can't afford to be unclean for seven days. They won't be able to serve the people. And how are they supposed to know whether this guy was dead or not? They can't touch him to check his pulse or even roll him over. And I don't think he's talking right now. The right thing to do in the eyes of the law was to not touch this guy. Modern interpretations of this story make a mistake by demonizing the priest and the Levi. Jesus is only using them to set up the problem. What's most important is what happens next. So along comes a Samaritan, a sinning, 
no good, snake in the grass Samaritan, (laughs) who in the eyes of the Judeans worships in the wrong place and does all sorts of other things that the Torah prohibits. The man in the ditch and the Samaritan would have been religious and political enemies. Think of it this way. There's a member of the Westboro Baptist Church lying in the ditch, and a gay man stops to help them. And all the hearers of this story are members of the Westboro Baptist Church. Something like that. So when the Samaritan comes to this bleeding, dying man, he stops because he's moved by pity. He violates religious and social rules and touches this man. That wouldn't have passed by the hearers of Jesus' parable. He touches the man, bandages his wounds, takes him to the closest hospital, and leaves extra money for his future health care needs. Here's what a group of scholars called the Jesus Seminar wrote about this parable in their book, The Five Gospels. They said the imagery of the parable itself draws on the long-standing animosity between Judeans and Samaritans. The parable subverts the stereotyped negative identity of the Samaritans and throws the conventional distinction between us and them into question. A Samaritan who goes to the aid of a Judean who has been assaulted and left for dead after two representatives of the established religion have ignored him has stepped across a social and religious boundary. Jesus' audience, which was made up of Judeans, would have viewed the story through the eyes of the victim in the ditch. The parable prompts them to think of the identification of their neighbor as a different ethnic group. The possibility of another kind of social world has come into view. This is then a story about offering hospitality across perceived social boundaries. After he tells it, Jesus asks his hearers, who was the real neighbor here? The answer is clearly the Samaritan, though the Judeans in the crowd wouldn't have wanted to say that. One imagines them mumbling, the Samaritan. (laughs) And then they're told to go and pattern their lives after the Samaritan. God can be found in surprising places, Jesus is saying. Wherever you find her, this God of love and radical hospitality and inclusion, go and make God-like choices like that in your own lives. So in the Good Samaritan parable, God is in the actions of people and is otherwise imperceptible. Is God hospitable? I figure God is something like what theologian Paul Tillich called the ground of being. Follow me here. For Tillich, God couldn't be a being because, as every elementary school child asks at some point, who then created God? Still, Tillich said, it's impossible to deny that being exists. Here we all are, being this morning. And he suggested that there must be a power behind being, which caused there to be something rather than nothing. So Tillich's conception of God is what he called the ground of being itself, the soil in which being arose and continues to thrive, the power behind all of what is, a life-giving force leading us to ever fuller life. Everything we say about that God Tillich said, is always an only symbol. And symbols are the best way to talk about this God. There's a great example in the, of this in the thinking of the late Unitarian Universalist minister, Forrest Church. Church's life experience led him to believe that the symbol of Mother God was more valuable in our culture than the symbol of Father God, at least, again, in the culture in which he was ministering. He said, quote, if the height of religious goodness lies in deeds of love and compassion, even as its lowest point rests in holy war, we might wisely turn from God the Lord and Father of mankind to God the Mother, Creator, Comforter, Healer. 
this works because of his experience with mothers. Each of these powers, he says, creator, comforter, healer, is no less great than the powers of sovereignty and judgment, but rather than damning, they save. End quote. Images of God change. The images we use to describe her are not God themselves. This kind of thinking is not new. It is, in fact, an ancient idea found all the way back in the Torah where people are prohibited from creating any image of God. And as soon as they have the chance, the first thing they do is create an image of God. And Moses comes back down the mountain and says, what the heck? I was gone for an hour. It was long ago. God is spoken of in the Hebrew Bible at various times as a father and a mother, a king and a bride, a wife and a husband and a judge, all intended to be images of various aspects of God, not descriptions of objective reality. Nobody thought God was a bride sitting up there. God was a judge sitting up there. This poetic, symbolic way of thinking about God is found throughout liberal religion today and is certainly prominent in Unitarian Universalism. So how might we even speak about such a God? Well, I would say we shouldn't all that often. But when we do, we can probably only do so by doing what Jesus and so many other great religious leaders did, by pointing to God in the world. It seems to me God can be thought of as a thread of life-giving love winding through our stories. When we follow her, she will lead us on the path of justice and love and peace. She is always present, always able to be found if we have eyes to see her. So back to the question of this sermon, is God hospitable. After further review, I think that's not quite the right question. For me, it's better to say that God is hospitality, or that hospitality is all we know of God. In the same way that the author of the epistle of 1 John in the Christian Bible simply says God is love and goes no further, I say that God is radical hospitality. God is a deep commitment to making the world safe for every single person. If we're looking for her, we can pick up the thread of God in our own stories and in the stories of the world around us. Or we can choose not to do that. We can choose to live out of tune with the God who is radical hospitality. We can ignore her. We can tend to our selfish desires and forget the world around us. That was Tillich's definition of sin. Tillich said sin was simply separation from our life-giving source. What I'll say to conclude is as close to an altar call as you'll get here. I think all this suggests a question for each of us. Don't let the language trip you up. Can you find the thread of God in the world around you? It's easy to find other threads today, isn't it? Threads of hate, threads of anger and exclusion and perceived differences. We can pick up those threads and pull at them and move along them and see all the ugliness. But can we pick up the one that is love and inclusion and radical hospitality, and follow it through this time. It takes commitment, I think. I urge you, whatever you call it, to find that thread, to hold to it tenaciously, to shape your life around that thread. Follow it wherever it leads you. In that way, we will create a more hospitable world. We will carry the God who is radical hospitality to all those we encounter. May it be so. Amen.